I'd like to welcome everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming. We have an excellent panel planned today. You know, North Korea has become quite an issue over the last couple of years. Two weeks ago, I was in Seoul, and uh, one advisor in the Blue House told me that the last two years for the South Korean government have been, as he put it, like a roller coaster. And he didn't mean that in positive sense. That uh, you know, two years ago, suddenly it's talk of fire and fury and potential war. Last year, it was all hugs and kisses and how much the, the president had fallen in love with Kim Jong-un. And now it's not quite clear you know, where we are at. The, uh, and of course, attention given to North Korea doesn't necessarily mean knowledge. You know, policy towards North Korea in many ways over the years has been uh, developed almost in a vacuum, certainly in, in, in ignorance. You know, people have long referred to North Korea as the hermit kingdom, hearkening back to the ancient uh, kingdom of North Korea that was very isolated. That, and I, my first trip there was in 1992, and I remember being struck by the ignorance of people in the United States, where before I went, I read about a, a, a discussion at the Heritage Foundation of people who included some people who'd been there, but the discussion was how, for example, in Pyongyang, there were no trucks, because, of course, they wanted Pyongyang to be beautiful. But, of course, there were lots of trucks in Pyongyang. And when I got back to the United States, I was called up by somebody from the State Department who said, uh, now, the North Koreans, do they wear socks? And I thought, now, that's a rather intriguing question. And I said, yes, so why do you ask? Well, because the only photos they had been seeing were from the waist up, so the presumption at the State Department at that time was that the photos were being taken from the waist up because they don't wear socks. <laughs> Which, uh, again, you, know, you kind of think of uh, you know, people who perhaps are watching Team America you know, for their understanding of North Korea and the caricature of Kim Jong-il. Uh, if you know, any of you remember that, the bouffant hair, the oversized sunglasses and platform shoes. The problem, of course, is that if one makes policy in a world of ignorance, one's likely to make rather bad policy. And there have been some important changes uh, you know, in recent uh, years. I was there two years ago, and I flew in sitting next to a British uh, citizen who said he was going in for his third tourist trip. And on this trip, he was going to fly in a helicopter and a microlight over Pyongyang. And I tried to imagine that back in 1992, the idea that the North would allow anybody to overfly the capital. I mean, clearly was, things were changing. <laughs> But I think what's important, and my hope is from the forum today, is not so much to talk heavy policy, but to rather you know, to provide some information. We have uh, three people who've been very involved in uh, activities in North Korea, all of them with humanitarian organizations that are carrying out missions in North Korea, all of them who are active in trying to help the, basically the people who are at the bottom of the heap in North Korea who most need help, particularly in areas of uh, health care and other humanitarian needs. And I've asked them all to basically give their observations in terms of the humanitarian mission and what they have they found. There's a wealth of knowledge there, of course. I think we can all recognize they have some realities in terms of having to be careful of what they say. So uh, you know, we appreciate that. But my belief is that we'll come out of this with a much better understanding of the realities of North Korea. There are real people there who operate, who have needs, who have concerns, who indeed will interrelate with us as human beings and not as political automatons. We're going to start with Dan Jasper on the right with the American Friends Service Committee. You know, if you know American history, you know the Quakers have been busy you know, throughout American history, and they remain very busy today, and among their missions are humanitarian missions, including to <coughs> North Korea. <coughs> then we'll have Heidi Linton with Christian Friends of Korea, we met actually in 2017. I walked out of my hotel room in the morning, this is in North Korea, going to breakfast, and I heard somebody singing Christian worship songs in my hotel in Pyongyang, which I thought was rather, shall we say, unusual. And the first morning, they were very busy singing, so I didn't really want to interrupt. It kind of tacky to say, stop everything, who are you? But the next morning when I came back, they were wrapping up, so I had a chance to chat. And I found out that Heidi is the sister-in-law of a very good friend of mine, Steve Linton. Two brothers involved, you know, children of missionaries, grew up in South Korea. Both have uh, foundations they're working with. So Heidi has been there many times. Indeed, Heidi just got back from North Korea on Saturday. 
So if she falls asleep during her presentation, you can understand a little bit of jet lag you know, still there. But very pleased to have her as well. And Randall Spadoni with World Vision. World Vision is another group that does an extraordinary amount of wonderful humanitarian work around the globe. Randall handles you know, North Korea. I think you were there in May? In March. 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 So again, people who regularly travel there. And he also actually has a very good reason for uh, being a bit tired. He just came back yesterday from paternity leave. You know, if there's one thing more difficult to deal with than North Korean bureaucrats, I suspect it's a newborn, and he's been doing that. And thank him very much as well for coming in uh, you know, after you know, having just gotten back. I've asked each of them to speak uh, you know, to these issues, then we'll go to Q&A, and then afterwards there will be a lunch and serve for any of you who want. But uh, Dan, if you'd like to start yeah, us off. Tell me where you are. I think up here is probably best. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for that introduction, Doug. I really appreciate it. Uh, and I really appreciate you holding this forum and um, for letting me masquerade as a peer to Heidi Linton and Randall Spadoni. Uh, these individuals have much more experience on the ground than I do. Uh, I've been to North Korea twice, uh, once in 2016 and once in 2018. Uh, and that's mainly because my role is really geared towards Washington, D.C. and representing our programs here in D.C. Uh, so I'll gear my comments a little bit more towards the policy arena and just how we've seen um, some of the impacts of recent um, uh, you know, rules and regulations and policy changes uh, impact our work on the ground. Um, like I said, I'm Daniel Jasper, the American Friends Service Committee uh, Public Education and Advocacy Coordinator. Um, so really briefly, I just want to touch on AFSC's history uh, in North Korea. Uh, the organization itself has been around for about 100 years. Uh, in Korea, uh, we entered South Korea in 1953, almost as soon as the ink dried on the armistice. Uh, we were there, we were one of the first organizations to uh, respond to a call from the United Nations uh, that was asking UN uh, or uh, NGOs for assistance in reconstruction efforts. And so we were there for about five years doing reconstruction. We helped um, reconstruct hospitals and houses and things of that nature. Uh, and that program wrapped up as planned five years later in 1958. Uh, we stayed engaged in the region, however, and in the decades that followed, we noticed that there was continual issues between the Koreas and the US's involvement with North Korea uh, was still a, a primary concern in the conflict. Um, so with that, a few staff members uh, attempted to enter North Korea, and, and they were successful uh, in 1980. And they were the first uh, representatives of a US public affairs organization to enter North Korea. And that kicked off a really, really productive relationship with North Koreans uh, that, that uh, has basically lasted through uh, all the political situations that we've seen uh, up until today. For about 15 years, we were primarily doing exchanges, and we would basically take North Koreans to the United States, uh, we would take delegations of Americans to North Koreans, and you know, I'll point out this picture in the middle is a picture of the North Koreans with an AFSC staff member in front of the Liberty Bell. Uh, it's, it's not something you see every day, but actually, uh, this, was, this was fairly commonplace uh, throughout the 80s and early 90s. Um, this was done primarily with the understanding that um, we were engaging for dialogue's sake, that we wanted to understand the other side's point of view. Uh, it wasn't necessarily a, a direct uh, sort of program goal in mind. Um, but this, this trust building, these, these engagements really did lead to something really quite uh, important. Uh, in the mid 90s, when North Korea experienced a famine, uh, AFSC staff were some of the first to uh, international um, uh, professionals that were able to, to sort of bear witness and that were sort of let in on what was happening on the ground. And so they immediately returned home and, and put out calls for aid uh, and started to, to sort of raise alarm bells in the international community. And that was born mainly from doing exchanges. Uh, as the, the famine subsided, uh, it, was, it was sort of recognized by AFSC staff that you know, uh, food security was an integral part of this conflict, and it was also something that we could contribute to directly. Um, while we are not an agricultural organization, uh, we understood that that's something we could help with uh, in the interim while we build connections towards, towards a, a, a larger piece. And so you'll see a picture here uh, up in the upper right that's a, it's a very typical picture of a monitoring and evaluation trip that we do. We usually go twice a year. 
Um, and you know, we go to the rice fields and, and do all sorts of things uh, in terms of pilot projects, trying to raise uh, agricultural yields, primarily with rice. Um, that has gone on for, uh, I wanna say upwards of a decade. Um, but with recent uh, policies in place, this has been very difficult to, to do on a regular schedule as we had done before. Um, so to touch on a few of the impacts of maximum pressure, they, they typically fall in two direct categories, two buckets. One is with respect to the uh, travel restrictions that have been put into place. In September of 2017, the State Department invalidated US passports um, for travel into or through the DPRK or North Korea. Uh, this is an issue, I think, for, for many people, uh, especially in the humanitarian realm. And the, the, the regulations do offer four exemptions. So you can get a, what's called a special validation passport, or sometimes it's referred to as a waiver in the press. If you are a journalist, a staff member of the International Committee of Red Cross, or you are going for compelling humanitarian reasons, or there's a fourth sort of blanket clause that uh, refers to the national interest, uh, which is sort of left vague and probably for, for a number of reasons. Uh, these, these regulations uh, essentially make timing our delegations extremely difficult. Uh, applying for these passports uh, can, can vary. Uh, the, the responses can vary anywhere from five days to 55 days. Uh, and so when you're planning uh, a number of things, it's, it's incredibly difficult to gauge when do we start applying for a passport, especially when we need information from our North Korean counterparts and, and they're not necessarily ready to, to give that information. Uh, and so it's sort of a, it's, it's a very touch and go system at this point. And uh, this year, uh, it looks like the, that due to the timing of all of this stuff, it, it, we may not be able to go on our spring delegation. Uh, last year, in fact, uh, during the fall, was the first time we were uh, not allowed to go to the DPRK, and that was uh, due to the, a decision by the U.S. State Department. That was the first time either side didn't allow us to go since 1980, and that was a decision by, by the U.S. side. I want to underscore that. Uh, just a few points on that. Prior to these travel restrictions, um, it's, it's worth noting, I think, that there were about 1,000 U.S. Uh, travelers to North Korea per year, which isn't much, obviously, but it's probably more than most people assume. Uh, and there were actually 200 U.S. citizens living in North Korea, uh, which is surprising, I think. I, I wasn't actually aware of that until after the regulations were put into place. And many were doing so, um, uh, doing humanitarian work or even just um, sort of day-to-day -day commerce activities, but uh, they were doing so because they had religious convictions that, that um, wanted to see the humanitarian situation improved in the country. The second bucket that, that's really impacted our work is, of course, sanctions. Um, sanctions have always been an issue for U.S. NGOs operating in North Korea. Sanctions have been in place since 1953, um, so there's always been some interference. Uh, but prior to 2017, uh, the situation was much better than it is now. It was not perfect, but it's much better than it, than it is now. Uh, and it's worth describing sort of what U.S. NGOs and how, and how they operated. Prior to 2017, we operated under what was called a general license. And this is essentially guidelines issued by the Treasury Department that says, if you fall within these activities, go ahead, do your work. You don't really need to contact us unless you have some questions. Um, today, the only activities that fall under those guidelines are sending strictly food or medicine. And this is problematic, mainly because uh, most organizations don't ship strictly these goods. And if you're shipping, say, something with a hypodermic needle in it, you will need what's called a special license because it has metal in it. And typically, that's the most important part is the needle. Um, the special license process is something that you have to go through with the Treasury Department that uh, essentially can take months to do. It's a very lengthy application process. It requires the, the help of uh, lawyers. Uh, and so essentially, we've gone from processes that took us a few hours um, to processes that take us many months to do and require expensive legal counsel. Uh, and this is obviously very problematic for when you're trying to time shipments, when you're looking at um, planting seasons versus harvest seasons, uh, it's nearly impossible to time it in the way that we have in the past. So that's, you know, and actually really quick, I'll, I'll mention this, that many of the materials that AFSC ships are, are plastic. 
and they are non-sanctioned items. Uh, however, uh, non-sanctioned items still require what's called a special license from the Treasury Department, the process I just described. Uh, and, and one of the things that we, uh, we send are typically plastic rice trays. And this was a project that we introduced to North Korea in 20, 2007. Uh, and you'll see a picture of it here. There's a, a poster of a man carrying a rice tray. Uh, and these trays are pretty simple in nature. It's where you start rice seedlings. And so when they're ready to be planted or transplanted, you sort of pop them out of the trays and you throw them in the fields. Uh, it's a very simple innovation, but typically the way that's done is that you start the seedling in the ground. And then when it's ready to be transplanted, you pull them up and you throw them in the, in the rice paddy. So when you pull them up, it, it sort of tears at the root and it can really injure and, um, and, and reduce harvest significantly. And so these plastic trays uh, improve yields by about 10 to 15%, which is significant for a country that's facing major food security issues. Uh, however, these, these uh, items can't be shipped without a special license. Again, as I mentioned, it takes many months. Um, recently, the UN issued a report. Uh, it was, uh, I think, uh, called the Rapid Food Security Assessment. And they outlined many of the issues that the country is facing. They highlighted that 10.1 million North Koreans are food insecure at this point. And then they went ahead and listed some of the items that are needed in this moment. And some of the items that are needed are of these plastic, you know, of, the, of this nature, plastic sheeting and things like that that can help um, increase yields. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, this is the type of stuff we would have no problem shipping uh, immediately to respond to calls like this. Um, but given the current regulations, uh, we're not able to do so. Uh, I know I'm a little bit short on time, but I did, I often mention uh, a, a basket of issues that are sort of uh, adjacent to what we do with the American Friends Service Committee and that we've always sort of kept an eye on and promoted um, it, that are of the humanitarian nature and that could probably be carried out today uh, if both governments agreed to it. Um, and I'll just quickly go through these. The first one is reuniting um, families. Most people have heard of the reunions between South and North. Um, but most people forget that Korean Americans are also part of this story. Uh, and there's largely two groups of Korean Americans that have family in North Korea. Uh, there's a group that, that often knows where their families are and could just go if, if there weren't travel restrictions in the place. Uh, and then there's a group of families that are still looking to find their families and, and, and need sort of a match system similar to what the North and South have. Um, this is something that we think is, is incredibly important to do, especially in this moment. Uh, these families aren't getting any younger. Um, and this is a great way to sort of bridge diplomacy, you know, in the interim between, you know, large diplomatic events or, or uh, summits. Uh, this is something that, that's a great exercise for diplomats to carry out. In a similar vein, uh, after the Korean War, about 7,000 US POWs and MIAs were left in Korea. We think about 5,000 of them are still in the north. Um, we've promoted uh, uh, basically military to military cooperations to find those remains uh, and to bring them back to the United States for identification. Uh, there's many family members that are still wanting to know what happened to their families or their, you know, their, their uncle or their father or what have you. Um, that, that are very interested in this. You may have noted that last summer, the North Koreans returned 55 sets of remains. Uh, and this is what I've heard from both North Korean and US officials say, uh, the most successful cooperation during this most recent detente to date, uh, because it is actually kinetic. It actually gets officials in the room to work through logistical issues. It's something that puts into practice. Um, however, that's been relegated strictly to the militaries, which is fantastic but our diplomats lack a similar exercise. And that's why we say right now is a great time to think about reunions. Uh, lastly, I'll just mention really quick, um, international exchange programs are something that we think the North Koreans have been really interested in a long time. And we think that you can go a long way in introducing them to, to uh, international standards through things like this. Uh, particularly, there's a program called the International Visitor Leadership Program. I'm a little bit biased. I worked on this program prior to my current job. And so I, I really promote this program uh, no matter what I'm talking about. But particularly in the case of North Korea, uh, North Koreans are the only country, as far as I understand it, the last time I did this, uh, looked at the data, was the only country that was not participating in this program. Uh, and that's a real issue when, when communication is low. And so this is sort of a low-hanging piece of fruit that we really think policymakers could seize on. 
Um, I, our policy recommendations are probably fairly evident at this point. You know, we, we'd like to see the travel restrictions moved or at least modified significantly to allow um, some family members to travel and to allow a little bit more human to human contact. Um, we would like to see, you know, and the way I said it here was adhere to human humanitarian exemption clauses. And I stated it like that because every piece of legislation and UN resolutions that have to do with sanctions with North Korea state that it's not supposed to interfere with humanitarian operations. From our understanding, from AFSC standpoint, we think that that uh, has not uh, been adhered to within practice. And so policymakers could do a lot in sort of tweaking these regulations to streamline these processes. Um, and it's worth noting that, you know, North Korea is not the only place in the world that's facing humanitarian restrictions. And we begin, we've begun to have conversations with policymakers uh, about something like a global whitelist that would essentially list goods and services that are required for, for humanitarian work around the world and would operate a little bit like what I mentioned, what was called the general license, uh, but at a global level. And then lastly, you know, we just like, we like uh, the US side to really see humanitarian issues as a bridge, not a stick. This isn't a way to, you know, turn off humanitarian aid and try to change the North Korean calculus. We've, we've seen that tried, it didn't work. It was very clearly a mistake. Um, and, you know, I think I came across this quote by Henry Ford that I think really illustrates why this is so important, especially in the, in the policymakers' eyes. You know, obviously it's important for our values. Um, but within the policymakers' eyes, um, Henry Ford said it best. He said, if there is any one secret of success, it lies in the ability to get the other person's point of view and see things from that person's angle as well as from your own. And it's the people-to-people -people contact, the humanitarian engagement that allows us to do that. Uh, that's why it makes it so important. So I'll leave you just with these scenes from North Korea, I didn't, uh, I, I know you probably came here for stories from inside North Korea, but I'll, I'll leave that to my colleagues who are much better versed than this. So, thank you. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> a big thanks to Doug and to Cato for inviting us to come today, and it's a, a joy and a privilege to be with my esteemed colleagues um, and to share with you a little bit about um, what goes on inside North Korea. Um, so we've been working in North Korea for the last 24 years. I just returned uh, Saturday home from North Korea. We were there almost three weeks. Um, we had a team of 10, and we were there from May 20th to June 7th. This is my second trip for this year. Uh, we did a lot of travel during the visit. Uh, we traveled to North and South Huanghe provinces, Kaesong and Pyongyang. And we were there to begin renovations of a lab that has been on hold for two years uh, due to sanctions-related issues. Uh, that we've been slowly working our way through. We finally got approval the Friday. We finally got our OFAC license that would allow us to do the work the Friday before we left on Saturday. Um, so we were grateful for that. Um, we also did some water system repairs. We've been putting in uh, gravity-fed solar-powered water systems for some years, and they all need repair from time to time. Uh, we visited TB care centers in, that we couldn't visit in March due to time constraints uh, to check on the arrival and distribution of the shipments that we've sent. This is an integral part of what we do. Uh, we usually make two visits a year that are all about um, uh, confirmation of receipt of the goods down to the rest home level where, we, where, where the majority of our work takes place. Um, and then we also cared for hepatitis patients through a diagnostic and treatment program that we established uh, about four years ago, it was the first ever opportunity for there to be treatment for hepatitis B sufferers, chronic hepatitis B sufferers. Uh, we opened our fifth clinic this time for the first time, one in Sariwan. Uh, we, we also did clinics this time in Pyongyang, Kaesong, and Heju. Uh, our lab work included uh, taking care of 362 patients, uh, doing diagnostics on those patients. We saw 330 people that came into our clinics, and we started 233 on antiviral treatment. So just to, I, I do have some photos, but they're not up here right now. Um, these are one-by-one -one interactions with patients. They have to come in for a blood draw first. Uh, we take two tubes of blood, 
And they go back to the lab, the lab that we rebuilt and have established and have trained the staff. The lab results are produced. Uh, they're entered into a database. And then the patients come back a week or 10 days later when our docs are there to see the doctors, to go over the lab results, and decide whether or not they are a candidate for treatment or not. Uh, as part of our work there, we do a lot of training of uh, both the staff and the patients. And uh, we also provided um, protocols in order to initiate the first uh, hepatitis C diagnostics and treatment program. In the process of doing this work, we traveled extensively in the southwest region of the country, including areas that were hit last August uh, pretty severely by flooding. We see a lot of progress in various areas, new buildings in Pyongyang, some reconstruction going on in the countryside, solar panels on many apartment balconies, even in small cities, but also many challenges, including the unintended impact of sanctions on the civilian population. Drought conditions persist this year. We saw many riverbeds that were completely dried up, some rice fields slow to flood, roads very dry and very dusty. There were new viaducts being built for channeling water to rice paddies that were under construction. There was widespread significant damage to many bridges, buildings, croplands, etc., from the late August 2018 flash floods that took place in parts of North and South Huanghe provinces. We had a number of road detours due to bridges being reconstructed by scores of workers and soldiers right in front of us. Corn was mostly planted, rice was in the process of being planted, potatoes were blooming, winter wheat and winter barley were turning from green to gold, some cabbage and other vegetables were planted. Greenhouses were being actively cultivated when plastic was available to provide vegetables and greens when they would otherwise be months away from production. We saw many large and small animals, ducks, geese, chickens, rabbits, goats, sheep, oxen, including new offspring. We saw many wild pheasants and heard many wild pheasants. Um, due to sanctions impact, tractors and other equipment are beginning to break down to a, due to a lack of available spare parts. We heard this from many of the care centers where we've sent these small tractors. We haven't been able to spend spare parts due to the metals restriction and OFAC licensing and other, other issues for really the last two years. While greenhouse plastic does seem to be available locally, there are quality issues with it. And purchases also require hard currency, which is hard to come by in North Korea these days. People are not complaining, but it is clear that there are many hardships. The situation varies county by county in terms of the support that can be offered. There does seem to be a priority being given to patients in need of nutrition. In Pyongyang, the coal plants ran at full steam, billowing pollution into the air and neighborhoods surrounding the plant. Yet, various discussions and issues of issues were very much on hold, awaiting resolution of the larger political diplomatic issues. This means that many very deep and entrenched problems can't really be dealt with until the larger issues are dealt with. People are largely frozen. They can't, they can't make decisions. We were warmly welcomed by longstanding colleagues in many locations, and our work proceeded largely per usual. There were perhaps some heightened sensitivities to taking photos, et cetera, but on the whole, this was a fairly normal and ordinary visit. In order to give you a little better sense for the more human side of things, I wanted to share with you um, something that one of my colleagues wrote after our last trip. I received it by email this morning. She begins her piece with a quote from Lamentations, chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. Remember my affliction and my wandering, the wormwood and the bitterness. Surely my soul remembers and is bowed down within me. My heart is weighed down with the pictures of suffering that are embedded in my mind from our most recent trip for the Hope Project. The suffering is intense. How long, O oh Lord? It is amazing the effects of this tiny virus which is ravaging bodies. Decompensated cirrhosis is manifested with ascites which is extensive fluid in the abdomen, low platelets, which result in bleeding from various parts of the body, and even encephalopathy, which means cloudy thinking. The person is so weak they can barely sit, much less walk. And as if this disease were not enough for the one bearing it, it breaks the hearts of loved ones. 
It is, in a sense, like stepping into a war zone, the war of viruses on health. It is gradual, not sudden like a gunshot or a bomb, but the effects are devastating. One can easily become numb to the pain as person after person sits in front of you, describing their struggles and the losses of various family members with the same illness. But for each and every person, the pain is fresh and real. I think of how Jesus healed person after person. Each person was an individual. He reached out to each one. So I come away praying that somehow we would have communicated God's love to each individual. I pray that those who are dying would be met by our Savior in their dreams. May they know the true source of healing and have eternal life where there is no suffering. One can get discouraged easily if one focuses on the problems and struggles of working in this country where the needs are so great. So it is paramount that we focus not on what we see, but on what we cannot see. God is working his good work somehow, despite the struggles and seeming wasted efforts. We must remember that it's not so much what we do, but that he is there with us. He has called us to this work. So let us continue in Lamentations chapter 3 with verses 21 to 23. This, I recall, comes to mind. Therefore, I have hope. The Lord's loving kindnesses indeed never cease, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. When we were in clinic last week, I was blown away by a doctor that came 65 kilometers on terribly difficult roads with a picture on his cell phone saying, my patient is, was here last week for blood draw, but he's too sick to come this week. He had a hemorrhage last week, and it's not safe for him to travel. I came here to get his blood results, and I came begging that you could start him on treatment. Would you release his medicine to us, so I, so, to me, so I can take it back to him? He was positive for Hep B. He was not positive for C. All of his other markers indicated treatment, so we released the medicine to his doctor for him to take it the 65 kilometers back on a dusty, long road to where his patient was. We see this kind of thing over and over again in North Korea. There are many, many people there who live incredibly difficult lives. They care about their patients. They care about their families. They're desperate for, for, for an answer to their medical issues, to their malnutrition issues. And we have, we have the possibility of stepping into this and reaching them and showing them love and mercy and showing them that the American people, that the people of the world, that Christians have not forgotten them and will be compassionate towards them. That is why we go to North Korea. It's very difficult. It's incredibly challenging. The sanctions have, uh, have given us a workload probably 10 times what it was pre-2017 on the administrative side. And yet, it is all worth it because we're able to reach ordinary, very ordinary, very sick people who have no other hope. And we have an opportunity to do that, and so we must. So thank you for coming today. Thank you for wanting to understand more of what North Korea is all about. It is a complex place. And uh, I'm just grateful that you're here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. Uh, thank you, Dan. I think uh, you can see that we do different kinds of work, but they compl we complement each other. Uh, we can't, can't meet every need. Um, sometimes there's huge expectations on humanitarian organizations that because we're the only ones who can travel there, or one of the few that can travel there, therefore we are responsible for meeting all the needs and urgency of the country. And we, we do the best we can with what we're given. Uh, for World Vision, um, I, I worked with World Vision for 14 years and with North Korea for the, that amount of time. I actually work with uh, all of our countries in Northeast Asia, with Burma, with Cambodia, Vietnam, China, Mongolia, uh, countries with their own unique set of, uh, of um, values and unique set of 
opportunities and unique, unique set of issues, and North Korea certainly exemplifies that. Um, I've worked as the program director for the last six years for our North Korea program, working with a team around the world that travels to North Korea regularly to implement our programs. We do work with, uh, let's see here, we do work uh, with agriculture, good work with nutrition, disaster relief, and uh, clean water. And you can see it's, uh, many of our longstanding programs cover many parts of the country and disaster relief would cover even, even more of that. So we have a chance to, to travel to uh, many parts and, and over many years, World Vision's been working there for 24 years um, and we've had the benefit of building relationships over that period of time, building some measure of trust and working on improving the effectiveness of our programming. I wanna focus a little bit on the clean water work just because we don't have that much time but maybe give you a taste of what that would look like for us. Um, so uh, about 40% of North Korea, uh, North Koreans don't have access to clean water. That means that they're drawing uh, water from springs, like in this case, they're drawing water from open wells. It could just be a few stones in the ground that are um, open to contamination, open to flooding, um, hauling water. It could be five minutes, could be 30 minutes from the water source to their house year round, so not only you know, uh, limiting the amount of water they can have, but also taking an enormous amount of energy, especially for the women and children whose main responsibility that is, hauling water, year, you know, even in the middle, middle of winter and very harsh winters there in, in North Korea. Um, so we actually traveled to the communities. I was there in March um, visiting our fifth community um, and we map, out, map it out with American engineers working with an engineer from Pyongyang and the local engineers. These are all in farming communities, cooperative farms. Could be 200 people, could be 6,000 people. And uh, walking the hills, looking for springs, looking for places to drill wells. Um, then we come back, we go on Google Maps, map it all out, put together a materials list and work over the next six, to, six months to two years on uh, actually um, implementing this. So we use uh, some old American drilling rigs. These are actually overhauled by James Linton uh, from Wellspring, an organization that's based in North Carolina and shipped to North Korea, uh, drilling wells, casing them, using, using solar energy to pump the water up into cisterns, and then it's actually piped into every single household in the community. Um, it doesn't matter how far away it is. So not just those who are in the center of town who receive clean water in the center in their, in their home, but every person in that village. And uh, transformative, especially for the women, to have all those hours freed up. They have plentiful clean water, not only for cooking and for washing, but also for agriculture and commerce, really. They free, up, free up time to do trading, free up time to produce uh, surplus in their kitchen gardens that they can they can trade for other things and invest in their families. Uh, so, you know, especially for children, especially for the elderly, it's, it's transformative. Uh, uh, more than a third of North Koreans suffer from intestinal worms. Summer and winter are the big period for diarrhea. Uh, so the health imp and the health implications are, are especially severe for the elderly and, and the children. Uh, so in, as I mentioned in March, we were there, um, uh, and finishing our fifth community, 4,000 people that received water for the first time in their lives. Um, and some had been hauling water for 70, 80 years. All of a sudden, their whole day is freed up. Uh, and uh, that's, that's our fifth community. That's 20,000 North Koreans. At least in the middle of all the politics, the challenges, sanctions, everything, at least we can point to those people and say that we've change their lives in some way. And that gives me some hope. Uh, we, we, face, we face so many challenges and so much discouragement sometimes. Um, and I just wanna mention some of the, you know, the uniqueness of working in North Korea. Um, Dan had already mentioned sanctions and Heidi. Uh, I don't think there's an, a country in the world that or maybe there are a few that have as many uh, barriers to humanitarian organizations working there. Um, this next shipment that we have coming into North Korea, water materials took us a year and a half 
to get in there because it required a license from the Treasury Department, because it required travel permission to actually assess and monitor the program, required a UN exemption, and all of those took so long to, to work out. Um, uh, we've been able to navigate it, but every one of those restrictions affects uh, the quality of our work and our ability to reach more people. And that's just the reality. I don't think it's the intention of, of the people who put the sanctions together, but that is the way that it's, it's worked out. And, and at the same time, very high standards for monitoring and accountability and effectiveness, first of all, by ourselves, but by anyone, by our donors, by the US government, um, by the international community. Um, so to, to weigh these, the effect of all of the obstacles that we have to implement our programming with our standards for effectiveness is a, is a major challenge for us. I think we meet the minimum standards for accountability and effectiveness, but there's a lot more that we'd like to do. Another unique dynamic of North Korea is that we're not actually resident there. It's the only country World Vision works in where we don't actually have an office. We have to travel in there. Uh, there are a few European organizations that are resident, that have expatriates living in the country, uh, and that helps them in terms of communication, helps them in terms of planning for their programs. Um, but because these organizations, including World Vision, are attached to uh, our American founding, our American identity, North Korea has not allowed us to become resident there. Um, and finally, uh, maintaining our identity in North Korea is a, is a challenge. We're an international organization, but we're considered to be American. We're a faith-based organization. And um, all of the mistrust that Americans have of North Korea are mirrored by the North Koreans towards the Americans. So when I go to North Korea, I have to, with each new person I meet, I have to overcome the challenge of their preconceptions of who I am as an American. I work for the CIA, work for the US government. Um, they don't understand the nature of what a non-governmental organization is. We have to work through that over time. And that's also a challenge we need to, we have an urgent need and yet we have really to spend a lot of time to overcome all of these challenges. In my better moments, I see these as opportunities rather than just challenges. The fact that uh, we're, we are not resident means that many of our team members have worked with the country for a long time, 15 years or more. Um, we have, uh, and that means that we've been able to develop relationships with, with people over a, a long period of time. They, they, in North Korea, they have one role, they get promoted, they go to another role, and, uh, and that's helped World Vision to, um, to kind of pioneer new space. There was one point when we couldn't even talk about monitoring in North Korea. I mean, monitoring was considered to be, uh, you know, like spying, right? Well, you're monitoring us, and what are you going to do with that information? That's been overcome. They understand monitoring, and they use that term now. We used to talk about targeting beneficiaries, and that whole word targeting, that's another military term. We talk about finding the areas in the country that meet the greatest needs. Who, ha who has the greatest needs? Uh, we, weren't, we weren't able to talk about that 15 years ago in North Korea. And over time, we've been able to overcome that and actually map the country out, look at the counties that have the greatest need, and, uh, and choose those places that have uh, the greatest need in the country. Um, so there are opportunities to be effective. We wouldn't be there if we weren't, but we have a long ways to go. I'll, I'll stop there. Um, I know there's a lot more we could cover, but we're happy to do that in question and answer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. We're going to go to Q&A. I do ask, please ask a question, not a speech. Uh, I'd appreciate if you wait to be called upon and for the microphone to come, because we want everybody here to hear you. And uh, if you could tell us your name and affiliation, we would appreciate that. But uh, so we're, we're open for questions, and you have a lot of expertise here, good experience. So, the gentleman in the middle. We have to get a microphone down to you in just a minute. <coughs> Hello, Ken Weiner, retired. Uh, thank you for your comments. I was wondering if you could give us a better sense of what life is like for typical Koreans uh, in North Korea. I would like to give a shot at that. 
It varies widely depending on where you live and what your what your job is, uh, what your status is. Uh, it just varies widely. Out in the countryside, if you're a farmer, you get up before dawn. Uh, you're out in the fields. This time of year, you're out in the fields uh, often by 6 a.m. Um, you, you work all day. Right now, they're planting rice, so that means bent over in a rice paddy, planting rice all day long. Um, until 7, 7.30, when the sun starts to go down, they stop for lunch. Uh, you'll see them by the side of the road. Um, you know, so that's the life of a farmer. Uh, you know, but, but just like in this country, we have, you know, how many thousands of different career paths, they have a lot of different career paths there too. Um, and, and so, you know, it just really depends on what, what you do, what your life is like. But it usually starts very early in the morning and goes until you know, late in the evening. Yeah, uh, about two-thirds of North Koreans are actually urban. So only a third are farmers. There's not that much arable land. And they, they have various roles. There's lots of sm small cities in the area, uh, I mean, in the country. And they may have some um, industry. Could be mining. <coughs> could be um, poultry, you know, large-scale poultry farming, something like that. So people will still report to their workplaces. Uh, they may have uh, other businesses on the side, but um, uh, they'll, yeah, they'll be up in the morning to music, pipe music in the center of their city. They might go through calisthenics. Some of them might report to their workplaces. Uh, in the cities, they don't have much access to kitchen gardens, and that's, that was a major challenge in the 19, 1990s with the food crisis um, because a lot of, you know, unless you have a, a garden to fall back on, uh, you're really dependent on whatever central organization there is for, for delivering food. And that has uh, thankfully developed a lot. Um, so if you're in, in the city, you hopefully have family in the country that you can trade with or that you can, that you can work with. So they might be, you, you see them along the roads, they've got their hand carts, they've got their bicycles with something on the back. They're going and meeting each other at the, you know, the fringe of the city and, um, and exchanging some goods. Um, and uh, that's, that's actually, that gives me some more hope for North Korea now than there was 20 years, the fact that they have ways of coping that they didn't before. If I could just ask, have you seen a major increase in market, kind of private business, private market activity? Definitely, since I've been going over 15 years, yeah. It was kind of hidden before that, and now it's right out there in the open. Um, I think the, the, one, the thing that hasn't changed a lot is mobility in the country. It's still very difficult for people to get permission to travel. So you see a lot of people on, by bicycle, but not a lot of, of uh, road traffic in terms of cars and trucks. Is that true, Heidi? I have seen some development of, bus, of, of a bus system, however. Uh, you, you know, traveling on the rural roads, you see a bus that's, you know, Sariwanda has uh, to uh, Heju or something like that. Um, so there is more regular bus service, and those buses are packed. They're little minivans often or, or whatever. So that has changed things somewhat, but it's still difficult to get the travel permissions, and they're often stopped at the checkpoints, you know, while they go through and check everybody. I'm uh, Peter Humphrey. I'm an intel analyst and a former diplomat. Um, your mere existence uh, flies in the face of the guiding national doctrine of Juche. And I'm wondering how the North Koreans in their minds deal with the fact that these gringos are over here, uh, you know, basically attacking Juche through their own actions. In other words, um, do, they, do they think you're doing this in South Korea as well? Do they assume that Dear Leader is funding your efforts? Um, or do they realize that um, you know, the enemy is funding your efforts? So how do, how do their minds get around all this? I don't know. Maybe you can ask them someday. <coughs> I, I just say that uh, when we operate there, we operate with complete transparency. Okay. I'm open to who, with who, whom I am, who I talk to, where I'm going next how World Vision works, how we relate with the US government or the South Korean government or any other government, and um, develop as, as best we can a meaningful relationship with our counterparts there, and hope that whatever narrative is going on in their mind is a positive one. I think it is. 
They never ask. Where the money? They never ask where the money's coming. Oh, sure, they might. Yeah, and we're open with them. I don't. I don't take. I don't, you know, we don't receive money from the U.S. government, but we've implemented food aid in the past, and they know where that's coming from. So, I, you know, my principle is to operate with complete transparency as far as where the funding's coming from, the kind of programming we're doing, and what our intentions are in the country. I don't know how that, you know, for each individual there, how that relates to their, you know, their upbringing and what they, what they think about their country, but at least we can develop some sort of uh, better understanding of each other. We are completely transparent um, that we are, I mean, we bring donor lists on every monitoring visit that's usually a four page front and back, multiple columns of all the names of all the people around the world, in the US, wherever, who have uh, you know, given in that six month time period um, to support the work that we do. We think that's a very important part of what we do is, is you know, conveying the, um, the good wishes, uh, the prayers of those people who support us, people, churches, organizations, businesses, whatever. We, we don't receive government funding. We, I mean, we did help implement the food program back in 2008 and 9, but that was a very specific program. For our current work, we, we don't get any government funding. And, and, uh, but, but we're very clear that, that these are people who care about them, and we tell them in our, in our meetings when we meet with the directors of these uh, hospitals and rest homes and whatnot, you know, what you see in front of you is a handful of the thousands of people that pray for you and support you and care about your patients and want to help you take care of your patients. So we're very transparent about that, and, and that is all translated. Yeah, yeah. yeah, just a quick note. I think that's a really fascinating question, <clears throat> and we've had conversations with our partners about Chuche, as well as our presence as an American organization. Our organization actually says American in the name, right? So they can't really get around it. Um, and I think when we had conversations with many of our farm managers asking, you know, what did you think when we arrived? What, what, what were you skeptical or what? And I think there's, there's sort of two reactions. Uh, I mean, they all say, yeah, we were skeptical of an American organization. One reaction is, so, you know, why, what are you doing here? What do you really want? The other reaction is, you know, why aren't you bringing more stuff? Um, I, I, and I think that from my conversations and understanding of Juche, which is limited, but I understand it to mean that it's, it doesn't mean you can't take help. It means that ultimately you have to be self-reliant. And I think that the, the definition has sort of morphed from, from a communal understanding of self-reliance to an individual understanding of self-reliance over recent years. But it doesn't mean that you can't take help. It doesn't mean that that's a, <coughs> somehow a stain on your honor. I think it just means ultimately you need to be self-sufficient. If that help goes away, you shouldn't complain about it. It means you have to carry forward, if that helps. And I think this is a country where you're not likely to voice doubts about the leadership you know, in public to, uh, you know, especially to foreigners very often. So there's, it's gonna be hard to get into the mind of the person in front of you in terms of exactly how they're processing this. Because in the society they live in, this is not the sort of thing you want to verbalize and present. So that's gonna be, there's gonna be a certain amount of inscrutability, I suspect. I mean, I, just dealing, I mean, I have not had this experience, but my last trip wandering around Pyongyang, one of the, my two handlers, whenever there was a statue, didn't do it to the paintings, but a statue of either Kim Jong-il or Kim Il-sung, he would do a bow. Because I'm fascinated by this, and I'm very curious what is going through his mind. But I'm not going to ask him, because I mean, to, to, he's not going to tell me, you know, kind of, oh yes, I'm just faking it for political reasons, right? I mean, so it strikes me from our relationship, there's just nothing to be gained from trying to push in there, because it's inconceivable to me, I'm going to get an answer that's truly introspective. You know, given the challenges of, of the place they're dealing with. <coughs> yeah, hi, I'm Mike Irocious, no affiliation. Um, North Korea has a very large military, and I assume they have a um, compulsory draft. Uh, how does that affect the, um, the workforce where the, the young, young people are being pulled out of the, the work environment into the military? And second question is, are you able to monitor whether or not any of your support or aid goes to the military? Our aid does not go to the military. Our aid goes to TB and hepatitis and pediatric care centers, period. Um, I don't know that I can really, co um, not everybody has to go into the military. Not everybody does. Um, a large segment does 
go into the military, but uh, not everybody has to. So, so that's one aspect. Um, uh, I'm not. I don't know if that answers your question. Heidi, one reason for your trips is you follow up individual patients. You make sure that the care is being yes. provided. So, I mean, so you, know, you, so you know where it's going. In terms of, yeah. And we've been working in many of these care centers now for more than 20 years. Um, we're actually graduating some of these care centers because we've done so much work and they're doing so much better than they were. I mean, they still need help, but... But, you know, they now have roofs, they now have windows and doors, they now have clean water, they now have greenhouses and tractors, so they're able to be more self-sustaining. So now it's time for us to move on and work with places, you know, again, TB and hepatitis and pediatric care centers that have not had outside partnerships and still need all that help. So um, we do see the actual outcome and impact of, of our engagement with them. And, uh, uh, and, and I see shipments, you know, I see the remnants of previous shipments when I go to see new shipments. So, you know, once it gets there, it's there, and it's used for the patients. Anything you want? Yeah, well, maybe just to add really quick, I think that the question about how that impacts the economy, I think it's a little bit difficult to parse that out because they do mobilize that for those resources for labor, right? So, and sometimes military personnel are mobilized for labor, and, and, and that goes for any sort of associations or whatever else exists in the country. Um, but I think, you know, just along with Heidi was saying, I think it's important for us to emphasize that um, we've never had an instance of our, our uh, shipments going to military. We go there twice a year to monitor it, make sure it's being used on the farm. Uh, that's why these travel restrictions can be really problematic for us, because we need to be on the ground to, to have eyes on the equipment. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Herman Bauma with the Institute for Objectivity and the Teaching of Evolutionary Theory. And uh, I understand that the burdens, the burdens that are put on the people of North Korea because of the sanctions, I'm wondering if your organizations and other NGOs, uh, if you all, had, if you try to influence the government of North Korea so that it'll take the necessary steps so that the sanctions are removed. Who would like to? Sorry. So the the, the question is why why don't we try to? Yeah, the question is, do you? Do we? No, we don't. Um, from our perspective as the American Friends Service Committee, we are an American organization. We speak to our government and the way that it handles the situation. And so from our perspective, the, the one critical thing here is to make sure that there are clear and categorical exemptions for humanitarian work. That's what we're concerned with. Um, the high-level diplomacy stuff is, is not something that we typically weigh in on. And if we did, it would not necessarily be on the North Korean side. We are an American organization, so we, we can't speak to their government. I think the prim primary reason that we have sanctions is because of the security situation, because of a nuclear issue, and that's just not an area that we, we cross over with. I think we do our best to build trust, to build bridges, to work on um, some interactions between Americans and North Koreans that may have indirect benefits for you know, diplomacy, but really that's not something that we can work on. Uh, and, we, we, can't, we can't play a very positive role in that because that's not our core competency. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, I'm John with the American Spectator. Um, so clearly each of you have experienced a great deal of difficulty with the American government, with the sanctions and so on. Uh, my question is, uh, in what ways have your activities been restricted or hampered by the North Korean government? So, you know, any work done in North Korea is done um, in partnership with your counterparts. For us, that's largely the Ministry of Public Health. Um, what we have found over the years is as we build trust, more opportunities open. Uh, they, are, they are more keen for us to engage deeper. Uh, when we first started working uh, 24 years ago, we were responding to the famine situation, and we started by sending food. It was very simple. 
It took a number of years to move beyond food uh, into, uh, into more what I would call more meaningful work, uh, which includes you know, clean water, agriculture, renovation of healthcare facilities, building of programs that actually change lives, such as our hepatitis program or TB work, tuberculosis work. Um, so, yes, you are, you know, your work is managed by your local North Korean counterparts. However, um, as you work to build trust, the door is open uh, because there's so much work that needs to be done. And, um, and if your work is, is valued by them, if, if it is viewed to be effective by them, and if you have capacity to, to move into greater areas, they are very eager to have you do that. For example, um, we, were, we were right in the middle of a huge project rebuilding the National TB Reference Lab 10 years ago. And they came to us and said, we have a big hepatitis problem. Nobody's helping in hepatitis. Will you please come help us? We didn't know anything about hepatitis, or I knew very little about hepatitis. But they said, look, you got to start. Just do something. So we started sending greenhouses and you know, tractors for, for, for care centers that were dealing with chronic patients to help build their capacity. And next thing you know, 10 years later, we have a hepatitis, a, you know, a, a, a hepatitis B diagnostic and treatment program built from the ground up. So you know, there's all kinds of opportunities that open uh, as you faithfully walk through you know, what you have along the way. Yeah. I think I. I, didn't, I don't want to emphasize sanctions too much. I think that's been a recent phenomenon for us that we've uh, been struggling to overcome. And it's not just the US, it's UN, and it's all of the, the nations that support those sanctions. Um, but for North Korea, I mean, the, the challenges have all over 24 years have started with the lack of trust. Um, and that, that has meant that every small step that, that might be easy in another country is, has been challenging in North Korea. The language you use, the way that you communicate, the kind of projects you can do, the new sectors you can enter into. Working with sanitation, for example, has been very difficult for us because they ask us, well, why do you want to look at our toilets? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a whole education process that, that, that takes a lot of time. I think our counterparts there are very hardworking people. We've built good trust, trusting relationships with them. But there are, um, I, I think the, the bureaucratic system in North Korea um, is not structured very well for receiving international aid. You have a lot of different small organizations within the North Korean government that receive aid from, and they have different mandates and work with different counterparts. But it's not centralized, and there's no um, there's no way of kind of looking over the whole broad spectrum of international assistance and coordinating it effectively. And I think that's something that North Korea should take on in the future: is taking a look how they can better receive international assistance and work, work with organizations. Um, uh, in World Vision, we're an, we're an international organization, but North Korea must compartmentalize us and make us an American organization and therefore tied with American policy. And that's been very difficult for us to, to adjust to. If I could ask, have you seen any changes on, with Kim Jong-un? I mean, in the last <laughs> eight years, has there been a, you know, a, a, a loosening? Have you seen a difference in terms of how they operate that has been helpful for you all? Maybe I mean there were some hints at, hints at it several years ago, but I think the um, the tensions, international tensions, have kind of diffused. I mean, if, if not diffused, but um, kind of undermine all of that. So we've really seen things slip over the last few years, unfortunately. I, I wouldn't attribute that necessarily to North Korean leadership or any intention to hinder humanitarian aid. It's just um, just part of what's happened. In the middle. Thank you, Gerald Chandler here. Can you tell me what you know about what other international organizations, NGOs are doing, and what the uh, North Korean government is doing? In particular, you gave the example of building water treatment and water supply. 
uh, next door or 100 miles away, do you see the North Korean government doing that? And you gave the example of treatment centers for med medicine. Do next door or 100 miles away, do you see the North Korean or other NGOs at work? I'm not sure I completely understand the question. Um, I, the, North Korean, uh, the North Koreans have a very extensive health care system. It is, um, they have many buildings, they have many staff. Um, the challenges are that, you know, a lot of the buildings lack for, for running water, they lack for electricity, they lack for uh, equipment, they lack for training, the staff lacks for training. So there are many challenges, but, but the, the network and the, I guess the, the foundation is, is there but it needs extensive development. Um, so I, I'm not sure if I'm answering you, your question completely because I'm not sure I... Is the idea, you know, if you see comparable activities being conducted by other NGOs or the North Korean government? Let me again go back to the water example. Uh, I don't know that it's necessarily important to you to see the North The question is whether the other people, you know, who are, are they being served on water? Is the government taking care of you know, their needs? There are other organizations working there. There are the about six European organizations that are resident in the country, and then a number of others that are non-resident that travel like we do. A um, number of them work with clean water, but you know the humanitarian community is so small in North Korea now that we actually I mean we really don't reach that many people so you might look at 50 or 60,000 people receiving clean water from international efforts um, and, and you also have to look at North Korea as well as I mentioned a third of the, the folks are uh, people in North Korea 24 million North Koreans are in rural areas and they're going to have different needs from those who are in urban areas that may need larger water treatment systems I know UNICEF has worked with um, some of the, the um, cities to actually work on their water treatment plants. Um, but overall, I would say it's um, at least over the last uh, 10 years, we haven't seen, I think, you know, you're always, you're always um, struggling against building something new or renovating something versus just infrastructure deteriorating. And most of the infrastructure there is at least 60 or 70 years old. And I, you know, it, it has seemed to me that overall uh, things aren't getting better in terms of the water situation, despite our efforts and despite whatever the government may be doing. That help you enough? Could oh. you get the microphone to please? Uh, my follow-on question. I've seen pictures of very tall, modern-looking buildings in uh, Pyongyang, and uh, there seem to be big residential buildings, and you've said that there are two-thirds of the people living in the cities. Mm -hmm. Does this imply that those buildings have good water systems and there's water treatment plants in those buildings? I, I mean, a lot of the photos you see will come from Pyongyang, and about 10% of the population lives in Pyongyang province, may not, maybe not in the city center. Um, I, I would say that the services that are in those buildings in terms of electricity and water uh, would compare with a lot of least developed countries still, um, and they, they may be spotty services. I, I don't know for sure, though. I haven't been in many of those tall buildings. Um, so you might look at NK News or some of the other sources for, for better information on that. Um, I will also mention, though, that the, there's a UN Needs and Priorities Report that comes out every year. That gives you a really good overview of everything that the international organizations, the UN or the resident organizations are doing. It has a special section just on water. Also, the UNICEF came out with a survey in 2017 that included clean water for the first time. So that's where we found out that over 40% of the rural population had, doesn't have access to clean water. We just didn't have that information before. Before, the number was 99% of the population has access to improved water. And now we have a, a better understanding what the actual needs are. So those could be a couple places where you'd start with, with uh, you know, looking at what efforts are going on. 
It, it might be worth mentioning really quick that in some areas, the, the North Korean government is unable to obtain some of the equipment that's necessary to carry out some of the stuff, especially in the realm of TB uh, uh, diagnosis, if I remember correctly, due to international sanctions. They can't actually get that equipment, right? They're sanctioned from getting it. And so they can't, they can't apply for a special license from the Treasury Department like NGOs can. Um, and, and carry that work out in the same vein. And in the issue of clean water, um, water filters have been an issue of contention for a number of US NGOs. I don't know if the North Korean government per se is sanctioned from getting that th those types of equipment, but um, certainly US NGOs have had a lot of difficulty in, in, in getting that equipment inside the country recently. Um, hi, my name is Esther. I'm with the National Committee on North Korea. Thank you so much for this presentation. Um, acknowledging that there are limits to uh, your access to the country and who you're able to, the needs that you're able to meet in the country, you know, collectively you've had 20, 30 years of experience. And I'm wondering if humanitarian aid to North Korea, because of sanctions or funding, or the North Korean government decided to, to stop um, access, can you provide a little bit of an overview of what would happen? What would be the impact? What would be the loss of American, other European, UN NGOs, uh, the UN agencies um, not having a presence in the country if, for example, a natural disaster were to occur, a food crisis were to occur? Kind of what would be the humanitarian implications of uh, ass humanitarian assistance being uh, terminated? Like to, to yeah, well, that's a really good question, and I think it's, I mean, it's difficult to, to, to sort of parse that out without a kind of factual, but I think that right now, just given where we are and looking at the data that we do have with humanitarian organizations operating in the country, we still have 10.1 million North Koreans are food insecure. Um, I just heard a projection from a Harvard uh, surgeon who was looking at the tuberculosis crisis. Uh, he said that if things continue as they are, one million North Koreans will die by 2030 because of tuberculosis. That's with humanitarian aid operating as it is right now, so sort of trickling in as it is. Without that, I mean, I, the numbers have to skyrocket. So um, I think that we have to start with what we know, and that is that the situation is pretty dire, even with operations going on as they are. I mean, that's the best I can answer that. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, we see it in the healthcare sector significantly, um, no question. Uh, tuberculosis is, in North Korea, is one of the highest in the world uh, outside of HIV co-infection, which North Korea does not seem to have much of right now. Um, and multidrug resistant TB is, is uh, clearly rising. Uh, it's again, it's it's a high burden country for multidrug resistant TB, which is actually a very scary disease. It's it's contagious, it doesn't know borders, uh, and it's a hundred times more expensive to treat than uh, than drug susceptible TB. So these are very serious concerns that we have. Um, of course, TB uh, uh, seems to be worse in areas where there is chronic malnutrition with the levels of diarrhea that we have in North Korea. Um, and with, with the levels of, of chronic malnutrition, uh, you know, it's, it's just ripe for increasing uh, more and more. Uh, they do struggle, uh, as Dan was alluding to earlier. Uh, we've been supporting the National TB Reference Lab. We built it and, uh, with, with the Ministry of Health and uh, have been providing ongoing equipment and supplies for it. And there's no way that the North Koreans can buy those things. Uh, you, you have to have special licenses to buy those things. You have to have banking channels to pay for them. You have to have, uh, in some cases, UN exemptions uh, to bring in goods that have metal in them. Uh, these are all things beyond the reach of the North Koreans at this point. So uh, does that mean that we're just not going to take care of, of TB patients um, uh, in, in North Korea and allow a hot spot like that to, to continue to grow and fester and think that that is not going to impact the rest of the world? Um, so these, these are very real concerns. I think, you know, uh, if... if if humanitarian organizations could not be involved in North Korea and then there were a catastrophic, uh, something catastrophic, we don't know what that might be, but uh, who knows, earthquake, you know, major typhoon, whatever, um, 
it'd be very difficult to restart some of these things. Um, uh, you know, it, it takes a very long time to build trust in North Korea. It takes a very long time to build pathways of meaningful engagement where uh, you can actually have effective programming. Um, and, and to dismantle that or to allow that to be dismantled by, uh, you know, by, by extreme sanctions or whatever that keeps people from doing their work, um, I think is, is, is setting, uh, is really a dangerous thing um, because we need to be, you know, the, the outside world needs to be able to help if, uh, if, if something uh, more catastrophic were to happen there. Um, and you don't just rebuild those things overnight. Considering that the Muslim misery and problem in North Korea and all over the world is created by policies of the United States administration and corporations trying to, uh, you know, loot, ransack, or get as much as possible economic advantage of other countries. What do you guys? Uh, propose to stop this part of the uh, problem rather than looking at, uh, you know, those countries that is appreciated what you are, you are guys doing. But it, it won't affect generally what's going on. It's not just in North Korea, it's in Africa, in South America, in Middle East, in all over the world. Do you have any idea what could be stop, stopping the United States government? That's a bit beyond the topic of the panel, I think. I don't know if any of you want to, you know, want to answer. I'm not entirely sure I understood the yeah. question, to be honest. I, mean, I, I think that, yeah, that, that's, you know, they've all said they don't do politics. And I think that, you know, and that an issue like that, I think, is a bit beyond uh, you know, our forum here. Um, you mentioned earlier that infrastructure was kind of constantly deteriorating and so forth. What do you know about um, general life expectancy, um, infant mortality, birth rate? What, what is happening in Korea? Is there any trend? I, I, you know, is life expectancy stable, going down, going up, and, and same for um, infant mortality and the birth rate? Well, the, there is some good information on that. Um, not like you'd find in other countries. I mean, you have, you have certain data points that are reliable and a lot of data that's not reliable. Um, so some of the UNICEF surveys have actually been very good in, in looking at, that, at those things. And I would, from what I've seen, the best that I've seen, the best data I've seen shows that the trends are actually, have been actually improving in North Korea. And for mortality has, has been going down uh, malnutrition has been going down, maternal mortality has been going down, not by huge amounts, and it's still, you know, t 10 times what it is in some of the other developed countries in the region. But, um, but the trends have been going in the right direction. I think the country has been more stable, generally, for the last 20 years. Food situation is stabilized, and production had been increasing until the last couple of years. Um, and, you know, for even the, you know, the lower level ser of services in North Korea, it's, it's a least developed country. It tends to reach the entire country, even, even those basic services. Uh, education enrollment is, is fairly high, so at least teachers are able to see most of the students in the area. Um, and that, that that's kind of goes against the narrative that you usually hear uh, regarding North Korea, that there has been a slow improvement in these. I think we're at risk of that being set back, especially this last year, the harvest was quite poor last year, and uh, we're going through a period of drought right now. Uh, there's also, you know, just, uh, just the entire international situation. Uh, we may see some regression there, but I think that, that points to some hope for the country. Um, that points to some credit to the ministries in North Korea, perhaps, or some of the international efforts to support, especially health in North Korea. 
And I don't say that as an apologist to North Korea or anything else. That's just, I want to look at the data and understand what the trends are and understand where, uh, where we can best work in North Korea. There have been some improvements, uh, definitely, in the area of, of childhood vaccinations. For example, they've been working with Gavi and others, uh, WHO, UNICEF, to improve that. And there have been significant improvements made there. Um, also, Caritas Germany did a hepatitis B vaccination ca uh, catch-up campaign uh, a number of years ago. So uh, we're now seeing far fewer childhood cases of uh, hepatitis B infection. Um, there's still concerns because hepatitis B vaccination, you have to protect the vaccine from freezing. Um, and so in rural areas in wintertime, you know, there are concerns about that, obviously. Um, but, um, but yeah, we have, we have seen some improvements. And I think the Ministry of Health in particular, one we're familiar with, has made a lot of efforts, uh, for example, in TB and other areas, to, to really try to, uh, to get a handle on things and, and to move things in a positive direction. But uh, there are many, many challenges still that uh, have to be overcome. And, and uh, in, in the current environment, it's very difficult. I'm sorry? Yeah, I believe it is growing uh, just just a bit. Yeah, it's at twenty four and a half million now, I believe. Dan, you want? To yeah, and you know, well, not to put a damper on this good information, but um, just as a, I think a word of caution, I think that we are concerned that these gains will be lost in this current moment. And you know, probably one of the most definitive studies that have been done on the impacts of sanctions on. Uh, child welfare was done in Iraq, maybe in 1993 to 1997. I want to say um, it, it showed that you know 500,000 Iraqi children were killed as a result of sanctions. We are worried about something similar. I, I, I don't think that we have any data to say that that's necessarily being carried out at this point, but we are concerned about this. And we've heard anecdotes that, you know, um, shipments of nutritional sprinkles, you know, sprinkles that you'd put on like ice cream that are sort of packed with nutrition that children need have been held up and, uh, and, and things like that can't, can't make it to, to their destinations. So, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is a point I think where we do need to assess, you know, are these, wor these gains worth protecting and, and how can we do that? The back here. Matt Haas, University of Richmond. You mentioned the lack of services and the deteriorating infrastructure in North Korea. And I was wondering to what extent that is due to capability issues and to what extent that's due to prioritizing other projects in North Korea. Well, I mean, I think it's it's a combination of a lot of things. Uh, resources are very limited in North Korea. Uh, it's very difficult to, uh, there's also, um, when we've gotten involved, for example, in our renovation projects, um, there's, there's, you know, they haven't seen some of the materials, they haven't seen some of the tools that we use in, in, in bringing about, uh, you know, electrifying a place and plumbing a place and in, in, in all of those things. Now that's rapidly changing. There are, there are big buildings going up in Pyongyang. Obviously, big construction companies are doing that. But out in the rural areas, um, you know, that, that know-how is not always available. Um, uh, we are seeing some changes in that area. I mean, there are solar panels popping up in different places. People have batteries that they charge that, you know, to charge their cell phones, to charge their, their lighting at night, that kind of thing in their apartments. So there is some general knowledge getting out there. But still, there's, there's a lack of, of, of both hard currency to buy the things that need to go to be installed, um, as, well as, uh, as well as the knowledge of, of how to do it, how to put it together, what you have to have in order for things to work. And we've seen that in the course of some of our projects. You know, they'll take on one element of it, and they think they know, you know how to do it, and then, and then we realize there's a problem later because they really didn't understand fully, because uh, this was the first time they were working with a heating system or whatever it was in, in, in that way. Um, so you know, it's a combination of, of things, honestly. Um, and uh, you know, oftentimes, for example, at one of the hospitals where we work, they decided, uh, the, 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 the local staff decided that their outpatient clinic needed to be renovated. And so the director said, I'll go buy the door. What are you all going to buy? 
Um, and, and, you know, and, and so the staff came up with, with different resources and, and uh, at the end of the project he said, look, we were able to, to do this, 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 and this. We're still lacking this. Can you help us with this? So, you know, th that's kind of the reality there. Um, and and uh, some places are able to do that. Other places have no resources to do that. So, um, so yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but it's a combination. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Leon Weintraub, a retired member of the U.S. Diplomatic Service. I'd like to b build on this, this last response of, of Ms. Linton. You mentioned the, you're installing gravity-fed water systems, and, and they occasionally do have a, a tendency to, to break down. It sounded like the repairs to these systems were somehow dependent on your trips going back and forth, and I'm wondering when these simple, I imagine these systems are not too complicated, do you also in include a component to teach people there how to maintain them, how to repair them, any possible improvising that they can do so they wouldn't be so dependent on, on inputs from abroad? No, we absolutely do try to teach as much as we can. Um, but one of the challenges is that um, you know, we want a system to last a long time. We want it to work for, for 15, 20 years. And sometimes they don't understand the big picture of what it takes for that to happen. And so they're willing to cut corners that we're not willing to cut. For example, uh, some of the guys who help us install these things um, grew up in Alaska or other cold places. And so they know that you have to bury pipe a meter underground if it's not going to freeze in the wintertime. And, uh, you know, if you get into rocky soil in North Korea, maybe they just want to go, you know, 30 centimeters or something. Well, that's not enough. It's going to freeze that winter, and then you're going to have broken pipes, and then you're going to have a broken system. So, um, yes, we, we teach every step of the way, um, but teaching one time does not change 70 years of understanding or of local practice. So you have to teach, and you have to teach and sometimes you have to learn the hard way and you have to teach again and and so uh, and and also some of it is uh, some of it is a little bit more complicated for example on this last trip we had a uh, a pump just quit working and we weren't sure if it was at the if it was at the control box or if it was down the hole of you know down where the pump was in the well turned out to be a a a connection a wire connection that had corroded through and shorted out, and so that section had to be replaced, but it also needed a, um, a waterproof connection made, and they, they just don't have those materials. So yes, uh, thankfully we were there. Uh, they were down three days, and we, we, got them, we got them up and running again, working together side by side with them so that they could see exactly what happened and, and how to do it. Um, but again, if they don't have the materials, and you can't anticipate everything that's going to go wrong on one of these systems, but we do the best we can. Yeah, this is Chuk, one plus one channel. Uh, my question is about sanctions and restrictions. There were uh, quite a lot of mention in here. How do they harm uh, all the humanitarian processes? So, what do you uh, actually advise to U.S. government? Uh, what is your point of view about the most effective way of uh, dealing with North Korea now, considering all the? Uh, information about new nu nuclear tests, uh, I mean, um, you know, rocket tests, uh, about all the military process um, Kim Jong il uh, makes um, last days. So the, the question is, what are our recommendations to the U.S. government to make uh, humanitarian aid effective and also with the larger situation? Is that right? Uh, the question is, uh, you say sanctions harm uh, humanitarian processes. So what do you advise? Like you, you say that sanctions should be somehow reduced or removed or some uh, mm, processes should be escalated um, otherwise. 
Yeah, no, no, thank you for that. I, I think the, the sanctions uh, and its utility as a, as a policy tool is probably left for a different discussion. But in terms of the humanitarian aid, I think what we would like to see is something like a return to a general license that I mentioned earlier, um, which is essentially, you know, the U.S. State Department, hopefully the Treasury Department, and the, those who the work in the country sit down together and, and start to, to hammer out what are the activities and, and goods that we're going to need to carry out. We've done this in the past, and it was with relative success. Um, absent that, I think we would also like to see perhaps something uh, like a global white channel, which would essentially work um, anywhere in the world, where if you're doing these operations, these humanitarian operations anywhere in the world, then you do not need to go through these sets of permissions. Um, that's a much longer conversation, but I think uh, it's, it's worth mentioning at, at this point. I think we have time for one more. This gentleman has had his hand up quite a quite a bit, so if we can catch him. Uh, John Burton with the uh, Korea Times. Um, Steve Began, when he was in Seoul in December, said that he would try to ease uh, the restrictions on humanitarian aid. Have you seen any indication that the uh, Trump administration is is proceeding on that course, or if not, why not? Is there a bureaucratic battle going on within the administration? Well, Steve Began did, did come back uh, to Washington and met with us in January and announced that as well. Mm -hmm. And yes, we have seen a change. Um, we've seen travel restrictions that have slowly been being granted, whereas they were frozen before. Um, we've some, seen some progress in terms of OFAC licenses. Um, so I, I, I don't think it, it kind of sets us back to where we were before July of last year, uh, which is an improvement. It's still not where we'd like to be. But yes, we did see a change in policy there, thankfully. Yeah, I mean, I think it's also worth noting really quick that we have appreciated the State Department's attention to these details. They have maintained communication with us throughout this process. Some of it is a little bit just the messiness of the regulations and how agencies interact and the, and the fact that we um, probably haven't taken them through the entire process in, in, a, in a way that we need to at this point. But uh, they have been somewhat responsive. We would just like them to see it go a little bit further in terms of humanitarian protections. Yeah, I might just add that you know part of part of the part of the complication of sanctions is also sort of the fear that surrounds them. Um, so sometimes when we go to a supplier and we're trying to buy something, of which there may only be one or two suppliers in the world for a particular specialty lab item or something we need specifically for a humanitarian context. Um, and, and now we're in an age of, you know, know your, know your customer, know your client. Um, they find out it's going to North Korea, and they just don't even want to deal with us. They don't want to run it up the flagpole of their legal team because they know it's going gonna, it's gonna to take over about three weeks of their lives as they look into all of our applications and look into all of our licenses and double-check to make sure that we've done everything perfectly correctly. And uh, so, so the answer ends up being no, even if it's perfectly legal. Uh, we also have the problem of, of actually paying for things, for example, things that we buy in third countries. The banking channel is largely closed down. So even while it's legal, um, it's still impossible. So um, th these are some of the things that we're trying to communicate about. And, and I, think the, I think the UN committee, uh, 1718 Sanctions Committee, certainly the government, uh, the US government has been open and listening and, and working to try to work with us to try to smooth some of these things. But it's very, very complicated. And uh, yeah, it's just very difficult. Well, we could give our uh, panelists a round of applause. We'd appreciate it. Thank <laughs> you.